Hello, everybody. How are you? It's great to see you. I love seeing everybody in this room. Thanks for filling up this room. And for everybody who's watching online, I want to welcome you as well. And uh, Chuck Gerns, we know you are out there. We all see you. So uh, thanks for being here. Let's give our online congregation a hand for being here today. Yeah, hey, before we jump into the message, I, I want to talk to you about the future of the church. And I want to start with this phrase right here. The future of the church rests in the hands of the next generation. Now, I don't know if you pay attention to this or not, but I pay attention to this a lot. And that is over the past 10 years around the world, we have lost a generation of children and students in the church. And that is a tragedy. And so these are, these are children, these are students who uh, once were engaging God, once were engaging the church, and for whatever reason, they have just disappeared, and we cannot afford to lose another generation. These are our kids, they're our grandkids, we are a family, and if we want to see the future of the church survive, we have to make sure that we invest in this next generation so that the hands of, of those who are following after us, they have the future of disciple making in their hands and they are biblically literate, Bible-believing, passionate followers of Jesus who can change their world. That's what we need to do. And so, in order to have that, we have to invest in their future. And so every year we have a focus where we ask you to invest above and beyond your normal giving. And so this year's focus is uh, equipping our children and students for kingdom impact. Our goal is $100,000 this year. And although that goal is not going to completely change the world, it's going to be invested in a way that we can add other things to it. And I think we can get to where we need to go. And there are actually two aspects to this year-end Christmas gift. There is a local and a global focus. So there's something here and there's something out there on another side of the world. Let me tell you about the local. The local is here at Zarephath Christian Church. We have our Z kids. We have our uh, Zarephath student ministry. And we need to invest in them. And let me tell you exactly what we're going to do with these resources. We're investing toward the hiring of a children's director and a student director, which, listen to this, currently do not exist. You're like, are you kidding me? Many of you did not even know that, and that's because we have some staff members that are overseeing areas that they probably shouldn't be overseeing because they have other things to do, or we have an incredible volunteer team of people who are just servants who care about the next generation, and so they want to invest. But we need to hire full-time people in both of these areas in order to accomplish what God is calling us to accomplish here couple of bullet points. Our children and students need a dynamic biblical program to prepare them to engage this culture with wisdom and courage. I don't know what it's like to be a student or a child in this age. I know what it was like to be in my age, and it was a cakewalk compared to what our kids are facing today. And so we don't want them just to survive. We want them to thrive, and we want them to engage the culture, and we want to see them as a part of changing the culture, of transforming the culture that is all around them. And in order to do that, they need to be led with a person who is passionate and 100% dedicated to that particular age group. And then children and student ministries are growth engines in the church. And if we want to reach more families, we must invest here. Many of you who are business owners, maybe you're, you're directors of, of areas of marketing or other industry, you know that there are certain growth engines there are certain things. If you do them well, it will expand your company's business. In the same way, there are people who are far from God. There are people that are looking for churches. And one of the reasons that they will come to a church is because there is a dynamic children's ministry and a dynamic student ministry. And we want ours to be second to none. And that will bring more and more families into the church who can come to know Jesus. Then they can get on board with becoming disciples of Jesus and preparing the next generation to be disciple makers. That's the local emphasis. The global emphasis is our Po River mission. How many of you know that we have a mission over in Po River, Liberia? Yeah. Uh, Stephen Jen Butwell left here many years ago. They established a, uh, a health clinic. <clears throat> They're also doing disciple making, and he's overseeing the school. 
And so when I talked to him the other day, I said, hey, I want to include you guys in this thing that we're doing with this year-end Christmas gift. What is something that we could do? And he didn't have to think very long. He said, creating a library for children and students at Po River Mission in Liberia, Africa with Steve and Jen Butwell. He said, that is the most important thing. I'm like, well, tell me more about that. Listen to these data points. Liberia ranks as one of the worst countries in the world for reading ability. N- not just in Africa, period. Okay, and get this, most homes in the Po River District do not have a single book. And there is not one public library in the entire country of Liberia. And if these young people are going to be the, the next authors uh, of Christian literature, if they're going to be the next apologist, if they're going to be the next disciple makers, if they're going to be the next evangelist to get the message of Jesus in their culture, in their area, they've got to learn how to read. And so we want to invest in creating a library so that these kids can actually learn to read. So the big idea is equipping our children and students for kingdom impact. Because we don't do babysitting here. We don't just do child care here. We are investing in the next generation. Does anybody hear me here? This is what we are actually wanting to do. So this is a year-end Christmas gift. $100,000 is our goal. I I know you're probably going to supersede that, but that's a starting point. But this year-end Christmas gift, and, and I want you to listen to this carefully, is above and beyond your normal giving. Say that with me, above and beyond. Above and beyond. Okay, so here, you say, what does that mean exactly? It means you don't take your normal giving that you typically give on a weekly or a monthly basis and count that as your year in Christmas gift. Because the reason you can't do that is because this gift is what? It's above and beyond. Okay, so you understand the concept. So for those of you who are like, hey, I give, you know, every single week in that little white box, or I give it online, or I do it once a month, or, you know, whatever the case might be, you keep doing that, but this is a time for you to dig deep, to sacrifice, and to give an offering that is above and beyond what you normally do for the sake of the next generation. You're like, well, I don't even give here. Okay, okay. Uh, then why don't you start with a one-time year in Christmas gift to affect the future of our church and another church in another part of the world by investing in this next generation. And we can talk later about how you should be giving the rest of the time throughout the year. That's another conversation, okay? So if you want to invest in the next generation, here's what you do. You go to zarephath.org slash give. Most of you already know about that. Then you select one time gift, because this is a one-time gift above and beyond your normal giving, then you use the drop-down to select year-end Christmas gift, okay? And once you do that, you're good. And and between now and the end of the year, um, you can do that as many times as you want, okay? So I'm I'm not going to tell you you can only do one time year-end Christmas gift. If you do one and you're like, you know what, Um, God's really blessed me. In fact, you say, how do I determine how much money I'm supposed to give? It's based on your ability to spiritually trust God and your financial capacity. And in the midst of that is one word, generosity. Some of you can give something with one zero because you're in hard times. Others of you two, others of you three, others of you four. We we have already had a five-digit investment in this because God has blessed somebody. And so I want you to think big. I don't want you to think about just this year in Christmas gift. I want you to think about the future of our church and the future of the next generation. Amen? So uh, I'm just going to pray that God would lead us in that, and then we'll jump into the message. Uh, God, thank you that there uh, there are people coming behind us. And thank you that you have a plan. You knew your mission to bring the world back into harmony with yourself was going to take hundreds and hundreds of years. And here we are 2,000 years later, and it's not done. And there's going to be another generation probably, uh, sh- should you not tarry, uh, that, that is going to be handed over the stewardship of the gospel and the future of, of our church. 
and, and many churches that they will lead, you know, as they leave this place. And so we know that you are behind it. We know that you have said that you're going to be with us even to the very end of the age. And in between the end of the age and in this moment, God, stir our hearts toward vision and generosity so that what is yielded is something that costs us something but blesses so many other people and ultimately you would be glorified in it. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen. Okay, thanks for listening to that and I appreciate what you're going to do in advance. Uh, When my son Noah was uh, in the Air Force Reserve's basic training, he had to test for different things that he might have some skill set or some competency. And one of the things that he tested in well that uh, was actually offered to him as a job was diffusing these. Anybody know know what that is? It's actually called an IED, an improvised explosive device. It's a homemade bomb that's used by terrorists and used by criminals in order to uh, create havoc in whatever world that they're particularly living in. And it's somebody's job to actually defuse these. Now, my son decided that that was not going to be his job. So, So he went in a different pathway. But I have to tell you, it takes a special kind of person to defuse a bomb. But but did you know that there are IEDs in relationships? There are ticking time bombs just ready to go off in our lives, in our marriages, in our families, in your workplace, in your friendships, with your kids, on your sports team. And if somebody doesn't step in with the skill to defuse that situation, then something is going to explode and there's going to be collateral damage everywhere. And that's what we want to talk about today. We're in this series called Heroes and we're going to look at a hero today who is a person who's called to step into a situation and diffuse it before it goes really, really badly. Now, now she's not a very well-known person and this might be not a a very well-known story for you which makes it all the more significant because she's like us. Just an ordinary woman going through her ordinary life but God called her to step into something and to do something extraordinary and her name is Abigail. Big Abigail fan over here. Okay, so uh, if you have a Bible with pages that turn or a screen that you scroll in old school or new school, let's get over to 1 Samuel chapter 25. And if you don't know where that is, uh, just take out the ZCC app or go to the table of contents. The app will have all the scriptures we're going to be covering today, some blanks and some other things that help you get a little bit more out of our time together today. So, Uh, Let me give you a a little bit of a a backdrop here. The year is 1015 B.C., okay? David, who was our first hero in this series, has actually been anointed king of Israel, but he hasn't ascended to the throne yet because the current king, Saul, is threatened by him. He's not going to give up his throne, and so he's hunting David down, trying to kill him. David is living in the wilderness. He has about 600 men who are faithful followers, And he's kind of on the run from Saul, and now he's running out of supplies, and they need something to eat. And this is where we pick up the story. A certain man in Maon who had property there at Carmel was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. So this is obviously a setup. You know, the writer wants us to know that uh, these people are as different as night and day. Uh, It's a wealthy rancher and his wife. And the scripture describes her as intelligent and beautiful. The Hebrew is actually translated literally this way, good in understanding and beautiful in form. Now, wives, may your husbands greet you this way every day when you walk into the house. Honey, you are good in understanding and you are beautiful in form. Can I get an amen from the ladies in the house? Yeah, that's something we should do, guys. Now, Abigail 
has a beautiful, beautiful meaning to it. It actually means father's joy. But her husband was not anybody's joy. In fact, her husband, on the other hand, was kind of a, um, a tool, as we would say today. He was an absolute narcissistic, selfish jerk. And his name was Nabal, and his name meant fool. Thank you, mommy and daddy. You know, can you imagine that? You're like, well, wait, hey, didn't you know that's what it meant when you gave me the name? So, I mean, we don't know if it was a given name or if it was a nickname, but either way, it actually fit. So, David is out there in the wilderness, and this is where the story continues. While David was in the desert, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So he sent 10 young men and said to them, go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. Now I hear that it is sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them. And the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your own servants and they will tell you. Just fact check that one. Therefore, be favorable toward my young men, since we come at a festive time. Please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. When David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name. Then they waited. So it's really not an unreasonable request considering everything. David had watched over his men, kind of protected them, gave them shelter and everything. And so he's like, hey, you know what? We're kind of hungry. We're, we're going to be moving through. Can you just find, you know, a little something for us? The future king, mind you, comes with a blessing and asks for just a little something. But what does Nabal do? He said, who is this David? Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shears and give it to men coming from who knows where? Now, you might be thinking in this moment, what a fool. Exactly. This is what this guy does. I mean, he, here's a simple situation. It could have been a complete win-win for him. But no, he has to take it in a different direction because here's the kind of guy, he just picked the wrong battles. Do you know what I mean when I say that? You just pick the wrong battles. And, and have you ever done that? Maybe you've done something like this. If you're, if you're a husband and maybe your wife stays at home or maybe she works at home and you come home from work and she's all day long been working with the kids and the dog and the homework and the house and the cleaning. And in that moment that you walk in, she's actually cooking you dinner. But as you open the door, there's a toy on the floor that you step on and you kind of curse and then, then you use that moment to talk to her about maybe she could keep the house a little cleaner. Anybody ever do anything like that? Please help me out. It's not just me, is it? Yeah, I mean, we do stuff like that. Or maybe you're a boss at work. You're a manager, you're a supervisor, you're a leader at work, and you have people that work under you, but you never acknowledge everything that they do for you. Instead, you choose to pass over that and isolate on the one thing they didn't do the way you wanted them to do it. And they feel, man, I can't win with this gal. I can't win with this guy. And it just makes them feel defeated. Picking the wrong battles. By the way, you know, people don't quit companies. You know who they quit? People. People quit managers. And if you're a manager, if you're a leader, you might want to keep that in mind. It is your responsibility to cultivate an environment where people can experience win-win opportunities. So pick the right battles. This is what he, he needs to learn here. So David, David's men move on, and they go back to David. And he says, did you go to Nabal? They're like, yep. What did he say? He said no. Wait a minute, no? All he said was no? Well, that's not exactly what he said. <laughs> you know, well, what exactly did he say? Well, he said, who do you think you are? And David said, strap on your swords. Now, when hundreds of soldiers strap on their swords, 
it ain't for a fashion show, okay? This is going to be a bloodbath. This, this is not going to be pretty at all. And, and, and when 400 men do this, it's going to get somebody's attention. And, but the irony of this whole thing, guys, the irony of this whole thing is that David came with shalom. He came with peace. But now that shalom is going to be turned into a sword. And Abigail knows this is going to happen. And this is where she enters. Abigail enters into the story. One of her servants came to her and said, hey, here's what happened. You know, and you know, your husband kind of did that thing that he does. And she, she assesses the gravity of the situation. And she knows that there's really no uh, point in telling her husband because he's so arrogant. He's not going to listen to anything that, that she actually says. And, and he'll, he'll bypass the whole situation and it's going to end in bloodshed. But here's what the writer said. Abigail acted quickly. Here's her first hero point. Heroes don't delay when they see trouble coming. You know, they don't, they don't back away from a situation. They don't, they don't go dark. They don't kind of shuffle it off to somebody else. They step into the moment. They step into the trouble. I mean, there's really no time for delay in this situation. And if, if you look at this whole idea of her acting decisively, it's repeated in three other verses. So it, it's telling us that this is one decisive woman. And, and I think one of my takeaways from this is that there are times that are going to come in your life, if they haven't already come, whether you're a man or a woman, where th there's no time for delay. There's no time to wait. There's no time to even seek counsel. You have to act and you have to lead. It doesn't mean that you're not a person of prayer. It doesn't mean that you don't listen to your community. It just means that sometimes there are moments when you are all alone and all you have is the wisdom that God has given you, the, the gifts that God has given you, and the courage that God has given you to step into that moment because there is no one else that can do it. And maybe God is calling you to one of those moments soon. So the story goes on. Uh, she took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, 60 pounds of roasted grain, 100 cakes of raisins, and 200 cakes of pressed figs and loaded them on donkeys. Then she told her servants, go ahead and I'll follow you. I'll meet you later. Now look at all this generosity. David didn't ask for all that. He said, hey, whatever you can spare. But now she is preparing a feast fit for a king because she knew David was to be king. And, and what I love about this right here is that heroes go beyond what's expected of them. She just could have done something very simple because David didn't say, you know, this is exactly what I want. She could have sent some bread and some, and, and some water and some wine and basically with an apology note that said, hey, David, sorry for the mix-up. You know, our bad over here back at the ranch. Please accept what we have here to offer you and no harm, no foul. Could, could have done that. But she's smarter than that. She knew what was on the other side and she knew that it was this kind of peace offering was what was going to be required to step into this moment. And, and I think, you know, just for us, <clears throat> there's a lot to be said about exceeding expectations, particularly since we live in an age where mediocrity is just kind of accepted. Status quo is okay. And especially as followers of Jesus, if you're ever given a moment to lead, you need to go way above and beyond the expectations that anybody would have of you. Because you are serving not some human employer, but as the Scripture tells us in the New Testament, you are serving the Lord in your work. So you do it better than anybody else would. And I'm inspired by this woman, Abigail, how she goes out of her way to care for, to protect, to provide for her family in a way that shows that she believes that they are worth her very best. She's not going to give them leftovers. She's not going to give them, well, that's okay. She's not going to give them, well, I hope this is good enough. She is going to go as far as she possibly can and leave nothing 
off of the table. This is what God has called us to. But here's an interesting thing the Scripture tells us. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. Huh. Anybody surprised about that? Why do you think she didn't tell her husband Nabal? Because the truth would be wasted on him. Because she knew his pattern. Because she had experienced times when truth had been brought to him and he was not interested in listening to the truth. Henry Cloud wrote a book called Necessary Endings, and he said there are two kinds of people in the world. Whenever you approach them with a situation, whether it's observation, whether it's correction, whether it's critique, there are people that lean in, and there are people that lean out. There are people that lean in because they are hungry, they are listening, they are desirous of growing, and they welcome feedback because they want to get better as a person as a boss, as an employer, as, a, uh, as an employee. And then there are people that, that lean out and deflect. They don't want to hear any critique. They don't want to hear any criticism. They don't want to hear any feedback, even though it could contribute to their future success. They just lean out. What about you? Do you lean in? Or do you lean out? What is your go-to? What is your pattern? When your mom sits down with you if you're a teenager and they just want to give you some feedback, do you lean in? Or do you go, what do you know? Or if your manager sits you down and says, hey, I want to talk to you about um, you know, your work product a little bit. I think if you tweak this, you know, it would make us better as a company. Do you push back on that and go, come on? Or do you lean in and go, tell me a little bit more because I want our company to be better? Are you the kind of person that typically in a marriage relationship, when your spouse says to you, hey, I want to talk to you about something that I think is maybe can help our relationship in terms of our communication or or our, our intimacy, and you're like, oh, again? Do you lean in or do you lean out? You say, well, I'm not really sure. Well, guess what? All you have to do is ask. Ask your boss, ask your employees, ask your mother, ask your spouse, ask your children, do I lean in or do I lean out? Because your future might depend upon that. So, what do you think about Nabal? Do you think he was a a leaner in or a leaner out? Anybody? He's a leaned out. He leaned out in the very beginning, and he leaned out in this moment, and he'd probably been leaning out his entire life, and that's why he had the name that he had. That's why he was called a fool. So, here's what happens. So, as she came riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, There were David and his men descending toward her, and she met them. David had just said, it's been useless all my watching over this fellow's property in the wilderness so that nothing of his was missing. He has paid me back evil for good. Listen to this. May God deal with David. He's speaking in third person like Jimmy on Seinfeld, if you ever saw that episode. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. David is speaking in third person, and he's almost declaring an oath to God as if God's going to be upset with him if he doesn't slaughter everybody on sight. This is kind of what's happening here. And... and David is on the warpath. Nabal doesn't have a clue what's happening. And Abigail knows exactly what is going on. And she steps in. Because heroes move fearlessly in the face of danger. I mean, there's all kinds of danger in this situation. If you look at 400 soldiers, they're coming down this ravine, okay, on this side. On the other side is one woman on a donkey. I mean, this is, this is actually what's happening. I mean, this is like a convergence of Braveheart, Lord of the Rings, Aaron Brockovich, and African Queen. You know, it's all, it's all coming together in this moment. 
I mean, she knew it was dangerous. She knew it was volatile. She knew it might be too late. But she steps into it anyway with heroic courage. You know, I'm always looking for ways to take something that happened in an ancient text and figure out how does that apply to you and me? And so when I think about courage, the courage of an Abigail, one of the things I think about are all of our single moms. You know, maybe you're in this room today and you're a single mom, or maybe you're watching and you're a single mom, but I have so much respect for you. And I don't know why you're a single mom. I don't know what happened. And, and, it, and at some level, it doesn't even matter. I mean, the pain matters, but no judgment. That's where you are. But it takes tremendous courage for you to do what you do. For, for you to, um, to continue to, to step up, to stay engaged, to be joyful, to invest. And, and, and you're doing it while working a job by yourself with very little help. But the reason that you do it isn't because someone's going to pat you on the back, because you do it because of what's at stake. The lives of little ones, the lives of the next generation are at stake. And you're like, if I never get a husband again, I don't know about that, but I am not going to go down. My legacy will not be I abandon my children. And I just want to say I applaud you. Yeah. But, but I also think about, and I'm just going to, you know, I'm, I'm just going to stay focused on this, this one thing right here. I also think about some of you who are in bad marriages, some of you women, because you're married to a Nabal. Let's just call it out. And I don't know how you got into that situation, but you're in it. And he might even call himself a follower of Jesus, but it's, it's not the kind that you want. He, he's the kind of uh, follower of Jesus who uses Scripture to abuse and manipulate and control. And he, he, he's all about uh, wives submit to your husbands, but he's not about husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And I'm sorry if you're in that situation. And I know there's a lot of pain there and there's a lot of hopelessness there. And I pray that God would give you the wisdom of an Abigail, the courage of an Abigail, the humility of an Abigail that will allow you to negotiate that relationship until something changes. And please, 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 if you are in serious trouble, if you need help, reach out to us. Do not do that life alone. So Abigail sees David. She gets off her donkey. It was customary in that moment. She bowed down to David. And now, take notes on this master class in negotiation. All right? She says, pardon your servant, my Lord, and let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Please pay no attention to my Lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool, and folly goes with him. And as for me, your servant, I did not see the men my Lord sent. He's, she's basically saying, I, I, I didn't know anything that was going on here. Here she is face to face with a man who's come to slaughter her family. <laughs> and this is when she shines. Because heroes know the power of grace and humility. Not character qualities you typically think of in a hero. You know, we think of the ones that are flashy. We think about power and strength and just courage and all that. But grace and humility. Her movement, her character is in stark contrast to that of her husband. And the writer wants us to see that. There's something going on here. Her EQ, her, uh, her ability to read a situation... Her sensitivity allowed her to understand that humility was the on-ramp to diffusing this ticking time bomb. That's what was needed. Now, just as a side note, I don't encourage you talking negatively about your husband, especially to another man. That's where affairs begin, and that would not be wise. 
But I will give this to Abigail. Uh, she was actually trying to protect her husband. In calling out what was real, she was actually advocating and interceding on his behalf. But she did it with grace and humility. And, and I think it's worth note, noting that um, when, when a person moves with grace or humility, especially some of you ladies, I want you to know this, this is not a sign of weakness or a lack of empowerment. It's just the opposite, really. It's really a, a sign that you have such a secure identity in Christ and in your personal walk with God that you're not going to be swayed by the opinions of other people who might think that you are less than when actually you are more than because you care more about being influential in the situation that God has called you into than what other people think. And that's how you should live your life. Now that she has David's attention, she delivers one of the most persuasive, persuasive arguments on why David, hear this, why David doesn't actually want to kill anyone. Okay, watch what she does here. Remarkable. And now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives and as you live, since the Lord has kept you, listen to this, from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal. Whoa, 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 whoa. Look, I want to look back at this. The Lord has kept you. That's past tense, right? David hasn't agreed to anything yet. But this is where she goes. And it kind of reminds me of this scene from Star Wars. Remember this scene right here? You know, when uh, Obi-Wan and Luke are passing by the stormtroopers and they're looking for these droids. And Obi-Wan does a Jedi mind trick on, on the stormtrooper guards and says, these are not the droids that you're looking for. And you remember what the stormtrooper says to his buddies? These are not the droids that we're looking for. This is exactly what Abigail is doing. She's kind of going, it's like, oh, now that God has kept you from doing that thing, you know, he's like, wait a minute, uh, what, am I? And she's masterfully doing something here that, that you're going to get a picture of in just a moment, okay? So she continues. And let this gift which your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the men who follow you. Please forgive your servant's presumption. The Lord, your God, will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord because you fight the Lord's battles and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my Lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord, your God, but the lives of your enemies he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. When the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel, my Lord will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself. And when the Lord your God has brought my Lord's success, remember your servant. Wow. This is an incredible thing that she's doing. And I don't know if you understand what she's doing here. But she's pointing David toward the future. She's basically saying to David, I want to remind you that you're going to be king one day. Act like a king. Don't let this gut knee-jerk reaction that's going to end in bloodshed, don't let this, this uh, kind of volatile thing that is welling up inside of you jeopardize everything that God has in store for you. And she uses the name Yahweh that's translated Lord seven times in her talk to remind David, God has a plan for you. Don't forget that. See, heroes do this. They point people to God's vision for the future. They don't live in the past. They don't necessarily just live in the moment. And I think all of us want to be pointed toward a better future, want to be pointed to a better version of ourselves, and we need to do that for each other. You know, for example, if your husband or, or your wife, and, and, and sometimes you fight in your marriage, and that's okay to fight in your marriage if it's leading to somewhere. But, but instead of focusing exclusively on what isn't, and getting stuck in the past or getting stuck in the bad moment, what you should do is, is talk to each other about, hey, what do we really want this relationship to be like? Let's point each other to the future because if we do that, we can negotiate properly in this present moment. 
Or maybe you work with a Nabal who is your boss, and what you need to do instead of, of, of kind of distancing yourself or, or gossiping about her or him around their back in the office place, maybe what you should do is, is bring the character of Christ into that moment, and you diffuse their anger with grace and humility and patience. Or, or maybe you're in a friendship right now and there's conflict between you and one of you is getting ready to go, you know, I'm done with you. What if you brought into this moment the ability to say, you know what, what, God has so much more for us. We've been through so much. God has a better future for us. And, and let's just learn to forgive one another and depend upon God so that we can have what God has for us in the future. Or maybe your mom or a dad, and it's just your, I get it, I get it, it's just your bent to pick out what your kids aren't doing right. And you just, you, you bring guilt and shame into those situations because you think, well, if they feel enough heaviness, they're going to change their behavior. What if instead of doing that, you begin to point toward what God might do in their life if they made some good decisions, some different decisions, and you pointed them to God's better future than getting them locked down on how they have lived their life in the past? That's a heroic move to treat it this way. This is the kind of person that Abigail was. So David accepts Abigail's gift he goes back into the wilderness. She goes back home. That's kind of the end of that part of the story. Back at the ranch, though, Nabal is throwing a party, and he is drunk out of his mind. So she comes back. He has no idea of the disaster that was just averted, and she's like, I'm not gonna, I don't like talking to him when he's not drunk, but when he is drunk, I'm definitely not going to get into this conversation. So she lets the night go by. Um, she waits for him to sober up in the morning. He goes, she goes and talks to him about what actually happened. And in that moment when he heard it, God struck him with heart failure and he died. Because his evil finally caught up to him. Because God, not David, executed justice on Nabal. God did what only God should do. Now, David heard about it. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, and I don't recommend this, praise be to the Lord. Okay, that's not probably the first response when one of your enemy dies, okay? Um, praise be to the Lord who has upheld my cause against Nabal for treating me with contempt. But here's the noble part of this. He has kept his servant from doing wrong and has brought Nabal's wrong down, wrongdoing down on his own head. Then David sent word to Abigail, asking her to become his wife. Huh. Uh, Abigail, as always, acted quickly, uh, got on a donkey, and attended by her five female servants, went with David's messengers, and became his wife. Kind of a happy ending kind of a thing. She became his wife. Now, you have to be careful not to misapply this ending because, ladies, you should not go, oh, okay, so pray for my husband to die so I can get a man with better abs and a great job. You know, that, <laughs> this would be, that would be so wrong, okay? That's not the application. The application is to be like Abigail in those IED moments. And the reality is Abigail wasn't perfect. She didn't do everything perfect. Which is a reminder, guys, every hero is flawed. Don't put any man, any woman in any situation on a pedestal because you will only want to knock them down later. The only person you can put up on a pedestal is Jesus Christ himself, because he will not fail you. Okay, that's it. But Abigail did the best she could with what she was given. And this is, this is what is true of you. You just, you just offer to God what he has given you. 
You use everything that he has given you in that moment. And as you act decisively, as you move courageously, as you negotiate in humility, as you point people toward God's vision and, and their place in God's story, that's when you become a hero. So, as we've been asking, is it your time? Where is that place? Who is that person? What is that cause where you can do something heroic in your marriage, in your family, in your business, in your school, on your team? If we act in the present, we can change the future. So let's act because the world is waiting. Let's pray together. Well, God, thank you for these kinds of stories, these kinds of people, especially this one, this Abigail, this normal lady who didn't have a superpower, but she had some unique relationship with you that allowed her to act on your behalf, that, that allowed her to act like you in moments when nobody else was. And so for the Abigails in our midst, for the husband who needs courage, for the wife who needs understanding, for the teenager who needs the integrity to step into a moment, for the boss who needs to cultivate an environment where people can become heroic, for the employee who by leaning in paves the way and sets a new pace and culture in their workspace. For the person who needs to step into a, a volatile situation between friends or between a husband and wife, equip them with everything that Abigail had so that they can avert disaster. Open our hearts, open our minds to prepare us for our next heroic moment. We pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen.